Vancouver Radio, episode number 137. Now, uh, in episode 136, I left you on a complete cliffhanger, and I apologise, but I can't have you listening to a two-hour show. iTunes will probably shut me down. Anyway, uh, let's not fluff about. You know the score. It's a steroid uh, special for the podcast. I've got Dave Crossland, and I'm going to drop you straight back into the conversation. If you remember, in episode 136... We were talking about the medical implications uh, and the character changing traits of steroids and we've already covered a huge amount and we're going to go straight back into more and more questions and essentially another hour of fantastic content. Right, here we go. You mentioned a couple of times uh, injectables and orals. What's the difference? Well, when you're putting it in your mouth and when you're shoving your ass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the injectables are oil-based. They're either water or oil-based. Um, in the water-based, generally, there's a suspension, which is a very, very fast act in a matter of a couple of hours. Yeah. The problem with water-based drugs is bacterial load is a real bitch. Uh, they can be really nasty ones. Um, orals are literally that. They are an oral tablet. Uh, the problem with an oral is it has to be alkylated to withstand breakdown by the liver. So as a result, it puts the liver under more stress. Okay. Now, if you were injecting testosterone, testosterone on its own has hardly any effect on the liver whatsoever. It's not liver type. Mm-hmm. Toxic at all. Liver issues by injecting testosterone. Well, you shouldn't have, unless there's an underlying problem that you're not aware of. Now, like all orals will stress the liver. But again, like I said... Um, I probably the heaviest oral course or oral element of the course I ran was um, 150 milligram of oxy a day and 150 milligram of um, anabar a day, which is a bloody big whack. And I've never pushed my liver values above 200. Liver values become a con- medical concern at 600. Okay. Normal. All is around 45, 60 something. Okay. So they were they were massively elevated. But if you went to a GP, they would just think you've had a bit too much to drink that weekend. So as a whole, do people tend to use injectables over oral or vice versa? Is there an, an effectiveness element to this? Uh, injectables are definitely safer uh, and definitely more effective. But orals are more convenient. Sure. Uh, and for a lot of people, starting the thought of shoving a needle in them is quite daunting. So they tend to do their first cycle on orals. Yeah. What a lot of people don't realise is that orals are fat soluble, so they should be taken on an empty stomach because if not, you massively reduce the bioavailability of them. Okay. Why do you inject it into your bum? I personally don't. Okay. Uh, I've never got on with it. I've always found it a difficult side to. I am unfortunately quite sensitive to injections and I tend to get a lot of swelling post-injection. Um, and I've got some structural issues with the biomechanics of how my arse actually works, which adds to the problem. I am fixing as part of what led up to the injury I've got, but I am fixing them now. But I've never been one for glue injections. Personally, for me, they don't, they're, they're, they're more hassle than they're worth. Mm-hmm. But the reason behind choosing the glue is it's a large, dense muscle mass with a low amount of vascularity. So you've less likely to hit a vein or an artery or anything like that. And you've got a nice big chunk of muscle there to go into. Fair enough. Okay, um, we've talked about kind of the mass side of steroids a lot um, and and getting big. But, you know, probably not wording them as steroids. We'll call them compounds. What are people using in terms of fat loss and the kind of cutting side of this bodybuilding equation? The probably most common one you've got are T5s, also known as ECA. That's ephedrine, caffeine, and aspirin. Yep. Ephedrine is a different derivative of amphetamine. It increases your metabolic rate and increases your body temperature. Caffeine and aspirin are there because they stop the body's ability to control temperature. Right. So therefore, you burn more calories. Uh, They're probably the most common fat burner there is. After that, you're looking at clenbuterol. Now, clenbuterol is an asthmatic drug. It's what's known as a pseudoephedrine. Mm-hmm. So if you take clenbuterol and you went for a drug test, you would actually give a false positive for ephedrine. 
even though it's not an ephedrine, it gives that effect on a, yeah. on a piss test. Main side effects with clenbuterol are increased body temperature, heart palpitations, blood pressure, and DTs, you get shakes. Now, the thing is with clen is the receptors are quite sensitive and they shut down very, very rapidly. Um, there are various versions of running clen two days on, two days off, two weeks on, two weeks off. It varies, but you're going to probably shut yourself down completely after four weeks of continuous use. There's some variation in that, but medically, on the, the, the average is about four weeks, you will shut your receptors down. And therefore, you'll have to take a break, allow your receptors to clear before you can start using again. Mm -hmm. Next one up, we're looking at thyroxines, T3 or T4. These stimulate, the th these are basically what's produced by the thyroid gland and they increase our metabolic rate. Now, when you start officially taking T3 or T4, if you take T4, it has to be converted by the body to T3. T3. If you take T3, obviously it's already usable. Your own production will shut down. The danger with these drugs is that your thyroid won't restart when you remove them. Mm -hmm. uh, if that gland becomes dormant for too long, it can become permanently dormant. Um, I mean, I have known of people using for long periods of time, it was a four years and coming off and having no issues. So it's not a definite cert, mm -hmm. but there is that potential. One of the big side effects with thyroid use, and which people don't actually, a lot of people don't realize, is depression. It can get you manically depressed very, very quickly. And it can be quite strong, as you know, it can be quite a hit. Um, particularly if you get the balance of T3 and T4 mixed up wrong within your body. You only work on a ratio of um, 4 to 1. So if you run 25 mg of T3, you run 100 mg of T4. Most people will just run T3. And it's low doses, you're probably not going to have any issues. But if you start putting high doses in, start going above 100 micrograms, you will probably find you're starting to struggle and you'll get very down. And again... Increasing body temperatures because your metabolic rate is running at a higher rate. You've got human growth hormone, um, which is um, again used as a fat loss agent. Now, to use growth, generally you use it low dose morning and night, but using it as a fat loss agent. Growth, if it's the real thing, which is the first stumbling block you have to get over because there's so much fake out there, it's unreal. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it's very, very good in the sense of the way it looks. I mean, I was only speaking to Pfizer last week who produced uh, growth, who produced um, genotropin, and we were talking about fakes, and they were saying that, uh, they, I was speaking to the head endocrinologist there, and they were saying that some of the stuff they've come across is unbelievably good. Wow. In fact, it looks better. Yeah. Um, but then a lot of the fakes do contain some active ingredient. It's just you're not getting the genuine pharma stuff. Okay. Um, and then, really after that, you're looking at the big one, the daddy of them all, DMP. By far the strongest fat-burning product on this planet. Also by far the most potentially dangerous. However, as a chemical compound in regards to the body, if taken in correct doses, it is actually not that dangerous. Uh, the problem with DMP, the danger with DMP is it's very, very dose specific. And if you get that dose wrong or you eat too many carbs while using a dose, that's when the real dangers start. But its actual toxicity to the body isn't that high. It's the effect it has on the body that's the problem. So what's its mechanism? Well, DMP is what's called known as an uncoupling agency. Uh, what it does, it... Um, you can ask me to say a word now that I can never get right. It uncouples oxidative phosphorylation. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Basically, it stops our body from releasing ATP as energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens is all the glycogen, all the energy we've got stored up in our body cannot be used. All the energy we gain from the food we eat cannot be used. So our body has to turn to our fat stores as an energy source. Ah. It's like a chemically induced key. Now, because of Newton's laws, 
Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Mm -hmm. All that energy has to go somewhere, has to do something, has to be something. So it's converted to heat. And that is the problem. Because if you take too much, you will overheat your body to such a point that you'll cook yourself to death. Now, this happened recently in the media, right? Last week. Yeah. Young girl. Now, the lowest dose I've ever heard of as fatality is 600 milligrams a day, and fatality occurred at four days. That girl took 1,200 milligrams. Mm -hmm. The week before, she spoke to her college about putting on an awareness evening for the dangers of fat burners, in particular DMP. She took eight tablets, a 125 mega tablet, then she walked into A&E and told them what she'd done, and she was very calm, she wasn't upset, she wasn't reticent or anything. And they explained to her that once DMP's in your system, you can't get it out. Mm. You can't flush it out with water, you can't do a blood transfusion, there is not a chemical that can neutralize it. It's there and it's there until it's done its job, which is roughly five days. Wow. So... They basically said to her, we'll do all our best to keep you cool, but pretty much you've come here to die. Now, she accepted that from what I understand. Mm -hmm. So I do think in that particular case, and we have a girl here that was slim anyway, um, and had a, a, a history of bulimia, and I do think with that particular case, we have someone that had some deep-rooted psychological issues with her weight mm -hmm. and had got to the point where, well, if it doesn't make me skinny, I'm quite happy for it to kill me. Wow. But her behavior is not someone who's taken a drug unknowingly and then panicked about the consequences. Yeah. You know, she's very calm throughout the whole process. She's very knowledgeable because she's already spoke to the college about the dangers of this stuff. It seems to have been a very conscious decision. I don't think she went out and thought, I'm going to kill myself. But I think she went out and thought, I can't stand being this fat, even though she wasn't. So if this doesn't work, then fine, I'm happy to be dead sort of thing. Wow. Um, I mean, I'm, that's only my opinion based on the information I've been given mm. on the reports of her attending at the hospital and what the College of Statements have said about her. But uh, that would be my assumption that there is definitely a deep rooted psychological issue in that particular case. However, there have been other cases where people have killed themselves accidentally. There was a young lad last year who was sold the raw powder version and he got the dosage wrong and he killed himself and the guy that sold him the powder is up on a manslaughter so he may have been prosecuted by now. It is, a, it is potentially a very, very dangerous drug. Mm. Hit the marketplace in 1931 and was banned in 1932. <laughs> wow. And then it was brought back to the marketplace by Dan Duchesne after he discovered the East German soldiers and Russian soldiers were, sorry, the Russian soldiers were using it. They were using it for its thermogenic properties. They were using it to keep themselves warm. Oh. But he noticed that uh, they were all lean as well. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is with this stuff, it's not an easy ride. It's a real rough experience. And to be honest, I, I think I'd rather, I mean, I hate cardio. I I class sitting on the Lewis cardio. I really can't stand the stuff. It's vile. It should be banned. I don't know. It's <laughs> legal. It's immoral. It's the devil's work. It, it should not be on this planet. I don't know who invented it, but they are sick and twisted individuals. Um, and I'd rather do cardio than take DMP again. Wow. So you've taken it once. I've taken it, and it's horrid. <laughs> wow. Okay. Think of your very worst hangover on the hottest day of the year wearing your thickest jumper, having not slept for three days. Wow, rough. That's roughly what you feel like. Yeah, to your face. Jesus. Well, um, I think, yeah, I made a post uh, last week on my Facebook page that got rather a lot of attention about the girl. And the only mere thing I said, because, you know, I didn't know the, the full extent of the issue, and all I said is, if diet culture pushes people to those extremes the media and the environment that we've created around diet culture needs to be accountable to a certain degree to make people feel that there is extremes to achieve what they think is unachievable yeah i mean that that girl without doubt had some serious serious psychological issues when it came to her image but have you seen the pictures of her uh, yeah she looked like a pretty young girl she's slim yeah 
There's no, no, not a million years could you call a fat. No. So what would drive someone to take six times the female recommended dose mm. of a drug that she knows is potentially fatal? Mm. That, that's some slightly twisted thinking. It is. It is. Uh, I mean, a lot of people going about body dysmorphia in bodybuilding and body dysmorphia in the culture and fitness industry in general. And I was lucky enough to interview the head of the UK Body Dysmorphia Association. And I was quite shocked to discover that actually to be classed as body dysmorphia clinically, it has to affect your life in a very significant way. Um, what they were meaning was in the fact that you will not go out or you will not attend a social event or you'll go to extreme to hide or cover up whatever your body that you were conscious about. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, a large percentage of us bodybuilders don't actually suffer from body dysmorphia. What we suffer from is what everybody suffers from, which is insecurities in our body image. And that's very common. And 70% of the population have that issue. Sure. We may be slightly more extreme in that. And I would think that we discussed this actually at the time that a diet in bodybuilder may actually go to a point within their diet where they actually are classed as clinically and body dysmorphic because the extremes they go to in the fact that they will not attend social events mm -hmm. or, or social gatherings because they're dieting they don't want to avoid temptation and they get themselves out of circulation would then start putting them in the realms of body dysmorphic but it'd only be for a temporary period mm. okay well, body dysmorphic well, is actually a lot more severe than I think we give it credit for. Yeah, no, I think it is. I'll, I'll bed that one because actually the last two shows have been on body dysmorphia. We've oh, had right, a, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. We've had a hypnotherapist on and we've been, he was fantastic and it was so good um, but because I see it as a big problem in the fitness industry, hugely. People's reasons of why they do things, take things. I think it's just, a, it's, I think, you know, so it, it, it is, it is a, a good description of some of the problems with modern society today. And I don't think the body of small fit label fits at all. Uh, I mean, for the first time in male history, we're, we're, getting, we're getting body image pressure. Mm -hmm. Women have had it all their lives. It's been within female culture for, for centuries. But now we're getting it. We're getting bombarded by Facebook and Snapchat and image this and God knows what else about having to look a certain way. And then the fact is that none of the images we actually see are real because they're filtered or they're photoshopped same with all the magazines you look at Flex magazine I'm telling you now that now send those pictures in there about when they were taken it happens all across the industry not just in the fashion industry not just in the model industry in the glamour magazines but in the fitness mags as well loads of the guys even the big bodybuilders are photoshopped to make them look more extreme mm. um, and then we look at them and think that's attainable well, it isn't because it was developed by a fucking computer. Yeah. Um, and and that, but then I I just find generally, I mean, I'm I'm getting old now. I'm 43 year old, and I find generally the insecurities in the youth now. I mean, I've got a 16 year old daughter, so I'm quite open her insecurities and how she feels about herself are a lot worse than they were when I was a kid. Mm. We only have to do with our immediate peer group. And you had a peer group that reflected the sort of person you were. You know, if you were a goth, you were the goths or heavy metal or whatever it was, you know, townies or whatever it was. You hang around with that group of people. Now, obviously, you get bombarded 24-7. Mm. And we all know, every teenager we know is sat there with a phone glued to them. They're ready. Constantly abusing themselves by looking at Facebook. Mm. Because they're bombarded with these images that they can never achieve. And as I say, it's, women have had centuries to to sort of I wouldn't say adapt to it but it's something that has, is sort of passed down to from you know mother to daughter about doing makeup and presenting yourself my dad never took me out to one side and told me how to dress or look in order to look right as a man mm. <laughs> and it's, it's a new phenomenon that we've never had to deal with before and I think it's causing a lot of problems yeah I mean I think you know, me being entrenched in the fitness industry, going to all these events like Body Power and seeing what happens on, on Facebook and all over social media, there is, I feel sorry for the average consumer in terms of what they're thinking with all the images, you know, the people that are saying, 
come and do my training and nutrition program. I am a natural lifter. Look at how good I look. And there's me standing there going, there's no way you are a natural lifter. I'm a natural no lifter apart from the 20 pro home, the sorry, the 20 peptides and the half, half ton of growth I take a week. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and uh, they, we, I, when I posted about this show on my Facebook page, there was a lot of comments about what is achievable as a natural guy. And no one, no one really has this image now of what is natural anymore because there's, there's so much blur. I've seen some outstanding physiques that I know are generally natural. And if you saw them stripped with no reference point, you'd think they were absolutely huge. Mm. But then when you see them dressed, they look like nobody. Mm. Um, and I have seen, and this, particularly there's a guy who trains at my gym, phenomenal physique. And I know for a fact he's 100% natural. Mm -hmm. No legs, because he doesn't, he doesn't like training legs, but he has a phenomenal upper body. Mm. He's, he doesn't beat about a bush about it. He's quite open about it, you know what I mean? He says, I don't wear shorts, so what's the point? <laughs> Um, but he has a not, I mean, a phenomenal, and he's in. I'd say he's probably four weeks out of stage condition all year round. Well, good just man. naturally like that. Mm. Lives off fish. Works at fish monkers, <laughs> fish wholesalers. Lives off fish. But he has an incredible physique. Worst training to technique I've seen in my life. But it works for him. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I, yes. yeah, I mean, it is difficult because of all the bullshit. We no longer know what is natural. We, we don't know. I mean, you know how many people post up, ah, oh, I've, I've done a 300 key squat. Oh, I'll show us a video then and know what they did was a 300 key knee bend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and it's like you're giving guys unrealistic goals because people look at that and think, well, fuck me, he only weighs 90 key mm. and he's squatting 300 key. Jeez, I'm shit. I'm only doing 200. Mm. Yeah, in fact, he could probably only do 200 if that, if he went to full depth. Mm. And, and it's the same with the with the the the, the natural argument. It, you know, it, it it's uh, I'm natural. Well, and I don't see the point. I really don't. What are you gaining from it? Come off it. Anyone with half a brain knows that Ronnie Coleman's not natural, or Phil Heath, or Kai Green, or any of them. Mm -hmm. We all know that they didn't build that physique on BSN. Yeah. You know? Yes, the supplements will have helped their nutritional needs at certain points within their training career. But they didn't grow that size on fucking protein powder. We're not dumb. Mm. So why all the cloak and dagger? You know, I love mutant when they let Rich Piana be open about his drug use. So for yes, did it damage mutant sales? Did it bollocks? It boosted them. Mm. So I do not understand the supplements industry fear. If it's done correctly in a controlled and managed environment, I think the information can be revealed. Maybe not the dosages, because if they have run high dosages, then possibly you could argue it's a little bit irresponsible because it will encourage others to do so. Yep. But definitely the fact that they use the compounds, I think, is... is, is and I think there's, there's all this... I know a few pros... And I know some of the cycles. And some of them are surprisingly mild. Mm. Some are. Some of them are mind-bendingly massive as well. But some of them are surprisingly mild. And to be fair, there's no real difference in the size and mass attained between the physiques of the mind-bendingly massive cycles as there are with the surprisingly mild ones. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's down to the individual and the way they react and their own genetic limits. But uh, it'd be nice to see some honest there, but unfortunately, I don't think it's ever going to happen. No, I don't think it's going to happen either. Um, I hate seeing it online. I distance myself from it. Um, I just wish other people could kind of see that. And I think people see it, but I think it's human nature to always want to believe, to believe that there's something better, that there's something that they can do. Yeah, uh, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as it's a healthy pot doesn't become a negative mm. you know if your aspirations is to someone who's chemically enhanced but you want to do it naturally then that's great because no you may never achieve their their level of development you'll probably achieve more of a level of development than you would have done if you'd gone for someone who was truly natural 
because you will strive for more continuously, mm -hmm. which is good as long as it doesn't start becoming a negative where you beat yourself up for non-achievement. But I, I think with the, with the lack of support a lot of people have around them, they wouldn't have the strength of character or people around them to actually realise that. And I think I see it as more commonly becoming unhealthy. Yeah, I, I, I am getting more and more people that message me with health and lifestyle issues, um, emotional issues and chronic issues based around their drug use because they're trying to achieve a certain look of goal and they've lost sight of what's realistic, sight of who they are. Mm. And I'm sure it'll be the same for someone who's natural, where they're spending every penny they are on supplements and diet and this, that and the other and just forgetting to live and be a human being mm. to achieve this goal that they're never going to achieve because it's not real. But uh, I suppose we all have a social responsibility to a degree to help people that are in that situation, but it's not always easy to recognise and they're not always willing to listen. Sure. Yeah, you've I mean, got to be willing to listen and a lot of people are so tunnel vision they, they don't want to hear it and they won't hear it. But it, it's true of all sports. I mean, I, I spoke to a pro bodybuilder about being open about drug use, and he's exact, and I quote word for word, were no professional athlete admits their drug use. Mm. Yeah, and um, maybe and you, because you're yeah. not a professional athlete, you're in a position where you can be very open, or you feel that way. I think you feel that way, but I have... I haven't seen evidence of the contrary, to be honest. Um, I mean, the only two people I know that are particularly open about the drug use is Rich Piana and Lee Priest. And Lee's not suffered because of the openness about drug use. He's suffered because of his openness about his political opinions. Mm. Um, you know, it's his other expressiveness about his beliefs and his opinion on the events that have caused him problems within the federations, not his openness on drug use. Sure. Um, I don't know. It's... You, I mean, you hear all these rumours about so-and-so uses this, so-and-so uses that, and then they say, well, I only use this much, I didn't use that much. And then you hear information from a very reliable source about that contradicts that, and you just sit there and think, well, I, who knows anymore? Yeah. I honestly don't know who's telling the truth anymore. Um, I know of certain pros that have discussed their cycles and I know the guy that used to supply these pros with their drugs, and the two don't match. Mm. Now, I can't say that all the drugs he got from that supplier were for him, but I know that the two don't match. Sure. Massively don't match. And I know the supplier has no reason to lie. Talking of drugs, how how does someone know what quality is? Like They don't. They don't. Okay. Uh, the Welsh Harm Reduction Service used to run a website called Windendos. Uh, and what they did on there was they offered a testing service. Now, it didn't test for strength, but it did test for product. And they would then post up the results on the website with the name of the brand, the product, and what the active ingredients within that product were. Okay. And when you look, that website's still online, so you can still go there and look. There is a surprisingly large amount of products that don't contain what they're supposed to. Sure. Uh, test ends containing test proc is cheaper. Um, Avar containing Dynabol, oxymethylone is containing Dynabol, uh, all sorts of weird and wonderful concoctions. There's even a couple where the drug it actually is is a lot stronger and a lot more expensive than what it's supposed to be. <laughs> I think that was just a genuine mistake. Yeah. Um, now, they haven't tested for strength, but I'll be honest, in my opinion, from what I see in the marketplace, I reckon about 80% of all UGL steroids are underdosed. Wow. So I, would you I say this... 50% aren't even what they're supposed to be. This website is probably a, an essential part of people's research if they're considering it. Well, if you're looking at a lab and they have one or two products on there that have been tested and they aren't what they're supposed to be, then you've got to, you've got to really consider the genuinity of that lab's production and its value about putting out a, a legitimate product. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I haven't been on for ages, so I couldn't even quote anyone on there particularly, but so the lab 
has three products listed and one's okay, but two aren't what they say they are, then you start thinking, well, if they're going to do it on two, who says I'm not going to do it on anything else? Mm. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's all about money. And what was the but, name of that website again? Wendinos. W-E-D-I-N-O-S, I believe it is. Okay. Um, it's But then again, there's, there's also, I mean, imagine you're a lab, okay? You produce 20,000 bottles a week. So you're relying on enough raw powder coming in each week to produce 20,000 bottles. Unfortunately, one week, customs have been a bit hot, and you've only got enough lab raw powder to produce 10,000 bottles. Mm. Do you, as a businessman with an established client base, produce 10,000 bottles and 10, tell 10,000 bottles worth of customers to go, sod it, you're not getting out this week? Or do you produce 20,000 bottles at half strength for one week? Mm-hmm. Do it at half strength? That's the problem. The yep. Black market. Supplies aren't consistent. Sure. And sure. labs have to deal with that. They have to deal with sieges. They have to deal with short supply of rows. I know one lab that actually shuts his door because he doesn't get his rows. He just doesn't produce. Mm-hmm. You'll ring up and say, I need XX. Oh, you ain't got it. Why? Because I haven't got the row. What do you mean you got the row? I couldn't get it in. You'll have to wait. Mm. Well, you know what No, I'm not, I'm not using cheaper stuff. I'm not using crap stuff. I'll have to wait till I get the decent stuff. I don't produce it until I do. Sure. But they are few and far between, unfortunately. So these labs that are producing steroids, are they legal entities? No. Okay. No. And do is this the something the government uh, try and actively kind of saw? What I don't know. The 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 UGLs are literally what the name says. They're underground laboratories. Okay. Uh, the private concerns in general in this country, and they can be as basic as somebody in the kitchen sink. Some are very very sophisticated, very very responsible, and produce very good and very high quality products. And they run very, very, very clever biochemists. And some are very unscrupulous, don't give a shit, and are crap holes. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, you've only got the reputation of the lab to go on because you can't get it tested. All you know is you've got a yellowy brown fluid in a bottle. You don't know what it is, you don't know what strength it is, you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know who's made it, you just got the name of the lab on it. Mm-hmm. Now, Unfortunately, if they are a successful lab, then there will be f- fake versions of that about because people will trade on the quality of that name, yep. produce a lot of standard product, and obviously make a shitload of money. But the other problem is where are you going to get your information from? Where are you going to get your information online through forums or groups? And unfortunately, the mass percentage of steroid users don't really know their ass from their elbow. <laughs> They'll say they do, but they don't. They really haven't got a clue what a good gear is mm. because they've never had it. Sure. They've always had substandard gear. So if you're used to getting gear that's 35% dose and you suddenly get something that's 50% dose, Jesus Christ, to you, that's good gear. Mm. It's only when you've had the real thing that you can benchmark against everything else. And that, that's the difficulty is that we people only have their experience in which to judge. Uh, and unfortunately for a large percentage of users that are online and active and groups, their experience isn't that much. Don't get me wrong, there are some very experienced people on there. But there's a lot that aren't. And, and unfortunately, people tend to speak to the masses. Okay. Um, I don't know how you class this in the steroid debate, but... I, I I definitely saw a lot of more information about this when I was kind of expanding my nutritional realm uh, a good four or five years ago. But the use of pro hormones. Now, where do pro hormones fit into this debate? Are they, is it snake oil? Are they legitimate steroids? What's the mechanism of comparison? Stero- uh, and now this is probably my weak subject, so you've got me on the back for you. <laughs> um, pro um, pro hormones. Or peptides. Pro-hormones. Pro-hormones. Because talking about peptides, I have no idea what you mean by peptides. All right. We'll go on to that one in a minute. Peptides is my weakest. (laughs) Pro-hormones are literally a legal loophole. They are a derivative of the steroid they mimic with usually a carbon atom removed. So they're not classed as a steroid because they don't match the chemical construction of that drug. Mm -hmm. Uh, When they enter the body, 
that missing carbon is replaced and they then become the steroid that they are derivative of. So if you take a probal hormone, you for the steroid it mimics. Because of the conversion process and because they're oral, they are in a lot of cases a lot more toxic than actually running the original drug in the first place. Okay. Um, they, I believe, well, they've recently been banned in the States. Um, whether they're going to make moves to do that over here or not, I don't know. Um, um, but so, I mean, some of them, are, Superdrol was probably one of the first big pro-hormone drugs. And Superdrol is incredibly toxic. I mean, even in its raw, its, its normal form, its, its steroidal form. And the reason this was was when they did the classification drugs in America, they missed it out. And that's the only reason it became pro-hormone and got sold, because they missed it out. It was actually a steroid, but it was never classified. Okay. Uh, but that stuff's incredibly toxic. I mean, you'll be pushing yourself at 60 mega a day of that stuff, from a toxicity point of view. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, yes, the steroids. It's just a legal loophole. Okay, interesting. Um, more newer age bodybuilders, I think... I'm I'm assuming this has come with the kind of the bigger guys. Like bodybuilders have just got bigger and bigger and bigger as the years have gone on. What's the deal with the distended gut? Ow. Oh, I have a couple of theories about this, but unfortunately they're not very popular, but bear with me. <laughs> uh, everyone says it's GH and it's insulin. Okay? Cause the guts to grow and all this bollocks. If growth hormones cause your guts to grow that much, then every frigging dwarf walking around in this country would have the guts hanging over the kneecaps. <laughs> because it's given as a prescription drug to dwarfs. Yeah. It's given to severe burns victims to help skin regeneration. So no. But what I think is it plays a secondary role. See, high growth hormone and insulin use allows us to eat more food. It allows us to push our digestive systems beyond what they were designed to do. Now, if all that food's going through, there's a lot more volume going through, therefore the gut is going to be stretched. Mm -hmm. That's my first theory. Add to that the way a lot of bodybuilders train now. I can't think of many top-flight bodybuilders that actually do Heavy, heavy, and I mean heavy, heavy squats and deadlifts. Johnny Jackson, Stan Efren, and I know there's those famous shots of uh, Ronnie Coleman, but he said himself he only did those for the camera. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Johnny and Stan are probably the two, two power bodybuilders that I know of that still do seven, eight hundred pound deadlifts and six, seven hundred pound squats and such like. Now, any good palace will tell you, in order to be able to squat and deadlift efficiently at those sort of weights, you need to have a very good pelvic floor control. Either Johnny Jackson or Stan have distended guts. And they're not on any less drugs than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And if anything, because they do such heavy compound work, shouldn't their guts be thicker and broader? Sure. So, if they don't have distended guts, but they have really good pelvic and everyone else is using machines or high rep work with medium weights then they're not going to have particularly good pelvic floor control because they don't need it mm. so I do think it's a combination of high food intakes particularly carving up into comps there seems to be this trend for very high volume carb ups into competitions and I think it's poor muscular discipline because there were all those pictures going around about of Wolf, Dennis Wolf, post Olympia, where his gut was out here. Mm -hmm. yeah, when he stood to the front and did a double bicep shot, his gut was tight as anything. Mm -hmm. Now, if his guts are distended, you know, if his abdomen is swollen, then he's not going to pull all that in. Mm. Muscular control. That's all it is. Okay. So I I don't personally think it's anything to do with gut growth and growth use or anything like that. I think the majority of it is there is some stretching of the ab wall due to high food intake, but most problem is down to poor muscular control. 
Interesting. Okay, cool. Now, um, I might be way out there with that one, but that's, that's where I'm coming from. It could be. Do you know they, they sound like quite common sense theories. I'm a big fan of common sense. I, I am. I, I, if it makes sense in my head, I can work with it. If it doesn't make sense or it's illogical, then I struggle with it. Yeah, yeah. And someone telling me that growth hormone is making someone's stomach grow, but nothing else, you know, and the hands aren't growing and the feet aren't growing and everything else, oh, come on. <laughs> Come on, if, you, if you're going to get a, a pregnant woman's belly through growth hormone use, then surely you're going to get something else growing. Mm. Mm. Um, okay, I've only got a couple more questions. I know we've uh, been talking for an inordinate amount of time and uh, I really respect and value your time, so thank, thanks already. Let's go and talk about this shit all day long. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think one of the interesting conversations that I've seen recently when I've tried to spur steroids is that we have a huge culture of people that want to see what it's like Mm -hmm. and and always set out on the path to say, I'll do one cycle. I'll see what happens. I'll build a bit of mass and then I'll try and maintain it. I see this, well, I'm going to assume that this just never happens. People see the effects, go, wow and can't live without that. So the, the question's twofold, I suppose. A, do you see that a lot? And B, do you think it's possible to do a cycle, come off, and safely maintain what has been built? Uh, I'll answer with the second part first. Yes. And okay. I have known a couple of people manage to do it. But you need to be of a strong character. You need to have good self-discipline and good, you know, good, good uh, self-control. But I have known a couple of people that have done one cycle, and because they've not pushed anywhere near the genetic boundary, they have been able to maintain that mass naturally post-usage. Um, however, like you say, a large percentage go on, and they get this feeling of well-being, and they get these big strength increases, and they gain some size, uh, and they can't go back from that. Now, quite often, especially if they're inexperienced, they'll lose a large percentage of the size again, or a lot of the size again will actually only be water weight. But because they've been stronger and they've felt that extra power, which has made them feel more confident and better within themselves, they crave that feeling again. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing in a way about steroids is they work. If you've got the genuine article, they do work, mm-hmm. uh, and they will transform your physique. Uh, and if your diet is on point, your training is on point, those transformations can be quite dramatic. And it's, it's, I mean, if you were a runner, and I said, here you go, I'm going to give you this tablet, it's going to knock two seconds off your 100 meters time. And you had that for a couple of months, and you competed with that, and then I said, right, sorry, you can't get that tablet anymore. Mm-hmm. you're going to be searching high and low for an alternative. Yeah. Because no one wants to go backwards. No. Nobody wants to recede. We all struggle with the aging process. We all struggle with not being as fit as we were, gaining a bit of extra weight, aches and pains a bit more, starting to look older. None of us like that. None of us like the aging process, and that's a regression. So it's within human nature. We just don't like going backwards. I mean, we have a bit of a family motto in our house is you don't go backwards. You can go sideways, but you don't go backwards. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's not in relation to trade, it's in relation to life in general, always moving forwards, always moving forwards. Uh, and, and it's the nature of who we are as people. You know, we, we, we like to succeed. We do not like to fail. And our society punishes failure. It's frowned upon. It's, you, you're not good if you're a failure. If you fail, fail at something, you, 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 the whole time is negative. If you don't succeed, you're a failure. If you're a failure, it's very, very negative. The fact is, if we don't, no one's ever succeeded without failing at some point. Mm. Or if they have, then they haven't pushed themselves to anywhere near the limits. Mm. I'd agree. Um, and and so it's it's w- failure is a, a natural part of the, the the process of moving forward and gaining in whatever we do, uh, and yet we punish it. It's a bit of a stupid mix up, really. It is. Um, I, I mean, I speak an awful lot in public about what I do, trying to educate other people, and I would say the fear of failure 
holds most people back in most areas of their life, where it's their, their job, their business, their physique. Um, people think that everyone judges them as being weak people. Yeah, yeah. And I, I always say to people, the sooner you can get your head around that failure is just another lesson and that it will teach you something to progress you will discover some inner greatness because if you can get over that and pick yourself up and do it again and do it better, you'll be an incredibly gifted person of whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. I do it when I train people on legs. I put them on a squat bar. I get the bar on the back at a reasonable way that I can manage and they stay on that bar until they fail. And I do keep repping until they actually fail mm. for one reason and one reason only. Once they fail, failed, because they're so scared of failing. Mm. They're so scared of failing on that compound movement. They're, they're so scared of pushing themselves to the point where they're, they're going to collapse. And yet when they actually get there and do it, yeah, they're tired and it's been a physical drain. But psychologically, was that that bad? No. So why are you scared of it? Mm. So I deliberately make them fail on an exercise so they can get over that preconceived fear of failure on that movement. Now, it's a, it's a very small and finite example but it's just like you were saying it's it's it broadened that out and the fear is far times worse than the actual event mm. you know i mean um, many 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 moons ago um i, I had a, a little bit of debt collecting <laughs> not, not proud of it but the thing was you never got physical with people because you use the fear of physicality to motivate them to pay the debts. Mm -hmm. If you actually got physical with them, there was no longer any fear because they'd experienced it. Mm -hmm. And the fear was always greater. I would never be able to hit somebody as hard as they thought I'd be able to hit them. Mm. And that, that fear of failure, that fear of pain, that fear of suffering holds us back from so many things. I'm myself included. I, I mean... To date, I think I've got 17 tears. Wow. That's a reflection of how I train more than anything else. And like <laughs> I said, I train for the enjoyment. So even though I could train more sensibly and be less, more injury-free, I wouldn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But now I've got to the stage where I must admit, especially on something like squats, you're stepping out with a big weight on your back and there is fear, you know, and there is a, oh, shit, this could really hurt me. Mm. And you've got to get your head, and I'm quite a vocal trainer, and one of the reasons for vocalization is to block that fear out of my head. So when I shout at myself, it's to just chase that fear away, to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, everyone has the wrong way of doing it, and unfortunately I'm a bit loud in doing it, which well, I'm getting in trouble for it now and again. <laughs> but... Uh, and yeah, I mean, fear is probably the biggest restriction as human beings we have, without doubt, mm. of, of any nature. It, it stops us from doing so many things. Yeah, uh, as soon as people can get their heads around that, um, success is theirs in my eyes. Um, Dave, we've, we've gone over a, an incredible amount today, and uh, I think I should probably just... I should close by giving you a chance to send out a message to anyone that's listening to this as almost a wrap up like if we're encapsulating this conversation what's what's your take home um look they work steroids do work they do do a job however they are not the be all and end all they are not safe you'll be shocked what you can achieve excuse me You'll be shocked what you can achieve naturally if you just believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you are going to make that decision, make it an informed and educated one and manage the risks. Do not go into it blindly. You can never know enough. Because once you've fucked yourself up, that's you fucked. Mm -hmm. You don't get a second body. You can't go back and redo it. And you'll kick yourself for the rest of your life for not just taking the time to ask a few people the right to do a bit more reading than you should have done. But trust me when I say this, the further you go naturally, 
the better your response you will have if you decide to go chemical. The um, bigger foundation you build as an actual base, the better physique you'll build with chemicals. Yeah. Um, there's actually one question I missed out from this, and I've just I've just seen it in my notes. In that, I, I think you already answered it, but I think people listening to this will almost want a number or an age. If you were to recommend someone take steroids, is there an age to consider it, or at least a training age? Um, you know, I think I think people really struggle with actually quantifying what their genetic potential is. Like I don't think I've reached it yet. No, um, age, oh God, right. From There's two answers here. One is a medical point of view. Our endocrinic systems, our hormonal systems aren't fully formed. Our brain function is not fully formed until we're about 23, 24 years old. Any chemical use before that point does increase the risk level upon those systems. However, I was 19 when I first started using, but I'd trained naturally for three and a half years, consistently, dedicatedly, and very hard. And I think it's something <clears throat> that's very in, down to the individual. If you can sit there in front of me and tell me that your diet is on point, for at least 85, 90% of the time, that your training is on point for at least 85, 90% of the time, and that you've got, you know what helps, what makes you respond when it comes to training, and you know what how you respond when it comes to various diets, you know, high carb, low carb, back loading, whatever it may be, then I would say you are in a position to make a decision about using. Okay. If you've not maximised your training and your diet, then what the hell is the point in putting drugs in there? Okay. You stick nitrous oxide for a one litre Fiesta, it ain't going to last very long, is it? <laughs> uh, oh, but people um, still do it. So, you know, you've, you've just got to build the foundations. And if you're consistent with your training, you're consistent with your diet, and your knowledge of how your body responds to those two things is of a reasonable level, then I would say, yes, you are probably in a position where using chemicals is going to be advantageous to you. The amount of people I use and never change is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And they'll blow up, put a stone on, two stone on, and at the end of the year, they're the same size they were when they started. So what was the point of using the chemicals? Mm -hmm. My last cycle, I gained 64 pounds. I'm 43 years old and I've been training most of my life. Mm. So if I can do it, all right, there was fat in that as well. I mean, I'm not denying that, but there was a good 30, 40 pound of muscle mm. in seven months. If I can do that in my stage of training, at my stage of usage, then I'm damn well sure you should be able to do it at the beginning of a cycle. So if you're not walking away from your early cycles with 15, 20 pound of regained muscle, then you're doing something severely wrong. Mm. And for most people, it's just they don't fucking eat enough. Yeah, well, I think this comes down to the, the the rationale behind this podcast is that a lot of people aren't educated enough and don't apply enough of the information they learn in a consistent enough manner to actually see the results. And that's why diet culture exists. It exists. I think people are complicated. Yeah, they do. They do. It's a lot simpler than you think it is. It, it is quite simple. I mean, I eat one of the most bland, boring, basic diets there is going, but it works. Mm. And it, it is. It doesn't have to be fancy, and you don't need to be having this teaspoonful of flaxseed oil at five minutes past twelve because it's going to trigger this and stop that and do. Fuck off. Just eat. Clean, healthy, regular. That'll get you a hell of a long way before you need to start worrying about those sort of details. Mm -hmm. But you see, guys, nine stone went through <laughs> with the most complex supplement regimes I've ever seen in my life. And I'm sat in there scratching my head going, what the hell is that stuff? Mm. And it's a prime example. Guy... His first or second cycle, 
He'd done nothing on either. Didn't even look like he trained in the gym. And he said, I need some form of estrogen suppression. I said, well, just use Novodex. It's fine. Oh, but I've heard that suppresses your, your um, IGF-1. Jesus Christ, lad. You want to be worried about eating a fucking bit of meat and shifting some weight? Not about your IGF-1 level. <laughs> but that's what they do. They get so wrapped up in these little snippets of scientific studies that, yeah, Novodex may suppress it, but not anywhere near the point that you're going to be concerned about when you're banging steroids in. Mm-hmm. Because I'll just overpower everything. Mm. Um, you know, and they get cooked up on these little snippets of fine neat detail and, and, and miss the basics. Hmm. You know, the 70s and 80s for seats were built out of hard work and lots of food. Mm. Yeah, they were drugs, but they weren't running peptides and massive insulin HGH protocols and all this, that, and the other. Fucking, they lived off Decker, Dynabol, and Sustanol, and that was about it. Mm. And they still managed to build physiques far in excess of 90% of the people we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yes, interesting. Right, um, Dave, I'm going to wrap it up there. It's uh, I've got to thank you for your time today. You've given me two hours of your time, which is hugely generous. And um, I'd just like to extend a thanks because when you did your intro to this podcast, I didn't realise how much you did to really educate people on, you know, uh, the pros and cons of this, especially, you know, the police and all that kind of stuff. I think it's a fantastic uh, tribute to the health industry, if I'm honest. Um, it's been really easy talking to you. You seem like a really nice, approachable person. I hope that at some point um, I get to shake your hand in person and say thank you. Um, despite you live in the north, it's colder. I'd have to put a jacket on. Um, oh, it's soft and soft, it. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's body power. I am, yes. I'm there on a Saturday. Okay, well, um, hopefully I'll be able to find you. I'll be making camp in the food area because, unfortunately, with this nerve issue I've got in my back at the moment, I can't walk for very long. Okay. So I'm literally going to walk in there with my food boxes and set up camp at a table in the food area. <laughs> and anyone that wants to say hello can come and yeah, find you. come and say hello. Oh, brilliant. Well, I will come and find you, definitely. <laughs> um Right, for anyone listening to this show, I, I, I really hope it's been of huge amount of value. The most important thing is that if you found this information useful is to go and share it with someone else. Um, we, we can't be having this information kept to ourselves. Uh, share it with a friend. You, you know, I know that this whole to- topic is a little bit PC, but you know, send it to them on a Facebook message. Drop a minute to an email. Just say, hey, this is really interesting. The most important thing, is, and Dave said this at the beginning, is education. Whatever decision you make, we have no dogma about it. It's just that you make the right educated decision. Dave has been very open and, and shared his use as a, as a user. I'm um, of, of, of zero opinion as a natural individual that just likes to enjoy his training, play rugby and eat some good food. It's as simple as that. So whatever your goal just make sure you are got the right kind of goal. Um, and if you've enjoyed the show, please do me the massive honour of leaving a review on iTunes. That's how the show expands and it grows. And I will be back on the show next week with Rachel with our usual Q&A show. So Dave, thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, and to everyone out there, please go and share this with someone else. Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 136. Now, today's show has probably been uh, one of the most anticipated shows when I've talked about it on social media. You know, I'm, I'm all for asking what people want to hear, what they want to discuss, and where education needs to evolve on this show.